Welcome to 10-Minute Philosophy, the show that's bringing critical thought to the 21st century, 10 minutes at a time. According to my to-do list today, we're defining terms, and the word of the day is... Logic. Or, more precisely, philosophical logic. Now, this is kind of a tricky one, because philosophical logic's not like some kind of monolithic category. It's more like an approach to assessing truth claims that's used a number of different strategies over the centuries. And so, it'd probably be better to call it logics... Or logics, logici, Log, log logicuses. Log, okay, well, since the plural of logic is annoying, we're just going to go with philosophical logic. Moving on, philosophical logic is defined by P. F. Strawson of, of Oxford as the proper elucidation of those notions that are indispensable for the proper characterization of rational thought and its contents. Notions like those of <laughs> what the? <laughs> okay, 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 okay. <clears throat> This is going to be a tough episode. I think we're going to need to break this one up into one more than one episode, so we'll call this episode Logic Part 1. All right, so let's start off with just plain Jane, vanilla-flavored Western Aristotelian logic. I know, I know. All the logic fanboys out there are going to be like, What? Aristotle? All the hip Vulcans know that bullying's been the scene for a century. And, of course, all the post-colonial theorists are going to be like, Yo, man, what about Mozi in China? Or Nagarjuna in Buddhism? Or the Nyavisheshkians? Or the Anikantians? Way to perpetuate the myth that the West invented reason. All right, all right, all right. Yeah, I get it. Seriously. But we have to start somewhere, so just step off and let me get my toga on, all right? So logic in general is concerned with understanding the relationship between ideas. Think of it as learning how to predict how... Truth functions from one idea to the next. It is like an electrical current of truthiness. Okay, so I'm going to build a metaphor here. And the way that I'm going to do it is I'm going to use Russian nesting dolls. Okay? Alright, so now, say I tell you that the blue doll is inside the green doll. That, and we'll call that statement number one. Then I tell you that the green doll is inside the red doll. And we'll call that statement number two. Now, using statements number one and two, you can conclude that the blue doll is inside the red doll, even though I never actually said that it was. That, my friends, is logic. So let's see what Aristotle has to say about this, starting with the first two statements. The truth function of these two statements is given to us by what Aristotle would call an immediate inference. And it works like this. When I say that the blue doll is inside the green doll, According to Aristotle, in your mind, you reflect on that statement and understand that it's true. And the word reflection is important here because, according to Aristotle, the only way that you can know that it's true is that you simultaneously understand the statement, the blue doll is outside the green doll, to be false. So, an immediate inference is when we take one statement and understand it by weighing it against its inverse, or we reflect on the fact that either the blue doll is inside or outside the green doll, but it can't be both. That's an important part of this whole system. Think of it like a binary code. So, like, binary is a series of 1 and zeros, where 1 means there is electricity, and 0 means there isn't any electricity. And that's the foundation of the process that allows me to make these videos, and the means by which you are watching this video. So, if binary gauges whether electricity is or isn't moving through a circuit, logic is gauging whether truth is or isn't moving from one statement to another. Got it? All right, so just as you understood that the blue doll was inside the green doll via an immediate inference, that's the same way that lets you know that the green doll is inside the red one. So you have two immediate inferences, right? Easy peasy. The third statement, however, the conclusion is not an immediate inference because it doesn't come from either statement. It's instead mediated by the other two, hence it is a mediated inference. So let's see how that works. So we know something about the relationship between the green doll and the red doll. And we know something about the relationship between the blue doll and the green doll. And we use that and using that information, we can understand the relationship between the red doll and the blue one because that relationship is mediated by the green doll. Right? Okay, so now let's move past these metaphors and go from nesting dolls to statements about the world. And it gets a little bit messy at this point because well, language is just kind of a crazy thing. So let's start by looking at the difference between subjective and objective statements. This isn't as, as nice as I'd like it, but it's a good starting point. All right, so a subjective statement would be something like, John Green's eyes are dreamy, while an objective statement would be something like, John Green exists. 
the truth of the first one is contingent on a number of things, like if you're seeing him in the right light and what your opinion of dreaminess is and things like that. The truth of the second statement is given to us via an immediate inference. He either exists or he doesn't. Another important feature of language that logicians often overlook is the difference between performative and informative communication. Now, if I say 2 plus 2 equals 4, that's just a piece of information. It's either true or false. That's informative. But an equally important feature of human language is how it's said or how it's performed. So let's look at the performative side. Take the sentence, I didn't say she stole the money. Now, if I look at it in solely informative terms, it's pretty cut and dry. Either I did or I didn't say it. But I can say that sentence in at least five different ways and convey a different meaning each time based on an accent. So I could say, I didn't say she stole the money. Or, I didn't say she stole the money. I didn't say she stole the money. I didn't say she stole the money. I didn't say she stole the money, right? Now, anyone who's had a conversation with someone between the ages of 13 to 18 can tell you that this is an incredibly important part of human communication. Now, logicians couldn't even touch this feature of language until the 20th century when Ludwig Wittgenstein developed his theory of language games. Now, and while his contribution is very valuable, logic still has a long way to go when it co comes to covering this gap between informative and performative. But we'll just put that on the shelf for now. So finally, let's think of statements as descriptive or declarative. Descriptive in this sense means subjective, like this is a lovely shade of green, whereas a declarative statement would mean green is on the screen, which is simply true or false. And Aristotle only wants to look at these kinds of statements, so that's what we're going to do. Now you can break a declarative statement down into four different types. You've got universal affirmative, universal negation, particular affirmative, and particular negation. They look like this. All X are Y. No X are Y. Some X are Y. And some X are not Y. Alright, so we've got all the green dolls are inside the red doll. That would be statement number one. Then no green doll is inside the red doll. That would be statement number two. And as we said earlier, both of these can't be true. So they're said to be a contradiction or contrary to each other. Now we've got some of the green dolls are inside the red doll, and some of the green dolls are not inside the red doll. I know, it's two ways of saying the same thing, but you, need, you might need to emphasize different classes of information given how much information you have access to at any given time. Now, the relationship between these two statements is said to be subcontrary because while they both could be true, they can't both be false. So now let's take all these statements and arrange them into a square. To tie it up, we're going to assign a letter to each, say, each statement. So let's assign um, A to universal affirmative, E to universal negation, I to particular affirmative, and O to particular negation. Got it? All right. Now we put these in a square. A and E are contrary. I and O are subcontrary. And I is said to be a subaltern of A. And O is said to be a subaltern of E, meaning that if A is true, then I must be true as well. And if E is true, then O must be true as well. Now, modern logicians will, of course, freak the frack out when I say this because this is the part of Aristotle's argument that's been shown to be the most problematic. But, like I've said before, we only have 10 minutes, so we're just going to have to accept this system for now, and we'll address the shortcomings of it in another episode, okay? All right. So if we shelve the modern criticisms, we can see that A and O are contradictions, and E and I are contradictions as well, because they couldn't both be true at the same time. With this system Aristotle created, he called it the square of opposition, and we can use it, along with a few other rules that we're going to add on in our next episode, to measure the truth function of any mediated inference, and use them to derive a conclusion from two immediate inferences and give us validity with our mediated inference. Or to put it differently, we'll be able to use this to measure truth functions from one statement to another. Okay, that's all we have time for today. Tune in again next time and we'll see what zany ideas come out of the man who pulled off the classiest comb over in history has to say. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button or you'll miss the next episode. Thanks as always for watching and keep on thinking.